Welcome to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. For more studies, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.org. And now, here's Chris McCann. Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Genesis. Tonight is study number 11 of Genesis chapter 7. We're going to be reading verses 7 through 10. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean and of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. There went in two and two unto Noah into the ark the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. Well, going back to verse 7, we read again that Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. And God makes a point whenever... He speaks of those going into the ark, that they went in with him. And that's because Noah is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is through relationship with Christ that the elect enter into the kingdom of God. And it's through an intimate relationship, historically, with Noah, that each one of the people that entered the ark entered into the ark. Noah's wife and his sons and their wives, the immediate family, the close family of Noah, all were delivered from the flood and able to enter in. And and so it says, Noah went in and his sons, his wife, his sons' wives with him. They all go in with him, just as all of those that are saved go into that glorious uh, kingdom of God with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says at the end of verse 7 that they went with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Now, uh, it's obvious historically that they went into the ark to escape the floodwaters. The flood that God had foretold and given advance warning to Noah that was coming and and the reason why uh, he was commissioned to build that vessel as a place of refuge for escape when, when the waters of the flood would overtake the earth. And so... Yes, they went into the ark because, or the reason they went into the ark, was due to the waters of the flood. But, again, we can learn some things about history. History is always interesting. And learning the historical um, situation and, and the events that actually took place long ago, now over 7,000 years ago, when the the first earth was destroyed by water. It is interesting to us, but learning historical events does not um, enable us to grow in spiritual things. The Bible is a spiritual book. And in order to um, learn and, and, and come to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, you have to go beyond the historical occurrences and see, well, what do they mean? What did they represent? What is the spiritual meaning in this historical parable that, uh, that the flood was? And, uh, when we, we think of the waters, we know that God likens the water to his word a couple of times. In Second Peter, Chapter 3, it says in verse 5, For this 
they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God. Now notice there, there's reference to the word of God, the Bible. By the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. We, we could say, by the word of God, the world that then was overflowed with water perished. The, the water of the flood is related to the word of God. And, of course, in 1 Peter 3, verse 20, speaking of the Lord Jesus who preached unto the spirits in prison, verse 20 says, which sometime aforetime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, were in few That is, eight souls were saved by water. Saved by water. And, well, that's stretching things a little bit historically. To say that the the people and the animals on the flood were saved by the water. uh, Because if it did not rain in that way, if the floodgates did not open up, and if the deluge did not take place, well, they um, they would not have been in danger, and they could have stayed on dry land. So, you, I don't know if you can say that the water that poses the threat and danger saved them, although it's true that um, because they were in a ship, that the water began to get higher and higher and lift up the ship and 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 finally lifted them up but, uh, above the highest mountains but but still it is stretching it a little bit to look at um, this literally that they were saved by the water and actually they were saved by God's forewarning and and by the ship by the ark is really what brought salvation to them. But the statement is made, they were saved by water because it is most definitely accurate when we understand water to identify with the Word of God, the Bible. It's the Scriptures, the Word of God, the Bible, that saves. And notice again, it, when we we have that spiritual understanding everyone entered into the ark with Noah his wife sons their wives all went with him into the ark and the ark is a picture of salvation in Christ because of the waters of the flood because of the word of God it delivered them faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God salvation has always been a result of hearing God's word. And and so God is here in that sense relating the water to the word of God that led them, in, in this case, they went into the ark at the threat of the waters. The waters had not begun to fall from everything we can read, until they were safely in, and then the door shut, God shut Noah in, and and everyone else, then the waters were upon the earth. And so it was the threat, the expectation of the waters, that led them into the ark. And uh, I think we can safely relate that to the worldwide proclamation the worldwide broadcasting of the message of Judgment Day, May 21, 2011, as this historical account of the flood relates, ties into the actual day of judgment for the whole world, 7,000 years later, to the equivalent day. And it was not the judgment itself. The judgment had not yet come 
upon the world when the word of God spread across the entire earth and and was proclaimed in every nation, especially over the electronic medium. It was proclaimed over radio, internet, it was on television and billboards and tracks and t-shirts and word of mouth and and the news media and every other way you could think of. Uh, I remember seeing a picture of uh, some old carriage in, I think it was in Africa, maybe South Africa, where a couple of people were carrying something um, like to mark it in the back of their old wagon uh, driven by horse and buggy. And they had a sign in the back about May 21, 2011, Judgment Day. The message covered the earth like the waters cover the sea. But it was a message that was God forewarning. Just as the Lord told Noah. In Hebrews 11, we read in verse 7, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. And and so God forewarned Noah of things not seen as yet. And the Lord, at the time of the end, opened up his word to reveal the sword that was approaching and the appointed day of judgment. It would be that date, 7,000 years to the equivalent day, May 21, 2011, that had the underlying Hebrew calendar date of the 17th day of the second month. And that message went worldwide and covered the nations. And because of the water of the flood, because of the message of God's judgment, many people, a great multitude of people, of course only a remnant out of the whole of mankind and barely noticeable, to the billions of people in the world, but a great multitude of people, nevertheless, were saved by the information, the advance warning that God gave. And because of the judgment coming, that is, the word of God that brought the message of judgment to their ears, faith came by hearing and hearing by the word of God, they were able to enter into the safety of the kingdom of heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ saved them in China, in India, in South America, in the Pacific Islands. He saved people that were his elect all over the face of the earth. And they were all being gathered, all being brought on board the ark. Just as Noah had the door of the ark open until that 17th day of the second month and the animals were boarding, they were coming from all over as God moved in them and led them to that site. Uh, You know, I recently heard a critic of the Bible, a critic of the flood, um, an atheist, I think, speak of how ridiculous it was for Noah to go around catching all these animals. Well, yes, that is ridiculous because it wasn't necessary. He didn't have to go out and 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 capture animals and bring them back like it was some sort of zoo. No, God just simply directed the animals. He moved in them to come to Noah. And at that time, the world was one continent. There was not the several continents divided we have now. That would not be until the days of Peleg. And so all the animals would have been on one gigantic landmass. And no matter how far away um, a certain species of animal happened to be from where Noah was, well, God could have begun moving in that animal and they would have migrated 
and eventually came to the point where the ark was being built and almost finished and and then they were loaded onto the ark at the proper time. And, and God did the same thing with animals over here and animals over there. After all, who is it that controls the animals, uh, that has given the breath of life to them and, and animated their spirits so they have the existence that they have? God is in control of the animals. He demonstrated that when he had a donkey talk. And, and he demonstrated that when he had a big fish at precisely the right spot when Jonah was thrown overboard. God led that big fish right to the place where God wanted him to be at that particular moment in time. Or when uh, the Lord Jesus was called upon to pay taxes, and I think it was Peter following the Lord's direction on where he should go, uh, to catch a fish, uh, and so he cast in, he pulled up the first fish, and inside the fish's mouth was a piece of coin that was sufficient to pay the taxes. And again, just just think of the amazing odds as as man looks at these kinds of happenings, the amazing astronomical odds it would be for the Lord Jesus to know exactly where a fish swimming by would be at the exact time that Peter casts in his line and only that fish, we can be sure, had sufficient money to pay the tax. None of the other fishes in the sea did, but only that fish. So it's absolutely nothing for God to work in all the animals of the world, all the necessary various species that he intended to keep alive and to draw them two by two or or by sevens or however many of each one was required and to bring them to Noah. And Noah would have all the animals at the ready, all the animals available for loading onto the ark when the time came. This is all a picture of God working in his elect across the face of the earth as he He saves them with his word. And, and what does the Bible tell us concerning the word of God? and concerning how God operates with mankind. Well, the Bible tells us in John chapter 6, in John 6, verse 44, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, if God can draw a man to himself, and even against the man's own will, well, certainly he can draw animals who are not so sinfully resistant. Animals have not sinned like man. Animals are not in rebellion against God like man is. And and so if God can draw the worst of the creatures, and, and without question the worst of the creatures on planet Earth, is a sinful, rebellious man, then he can draw the rest. And, and that's what he did. And that's a, as all the animals were drawn to the ark, they, they could have themselves just, just had this, um, mysterious desire within them to suddenly, uh, just travel and, and to go on a trip. And, and maybe they didn't even know why they wanted to wander and journey, and they had never done that before. But it was God's leading and drawing of the animals, and eventually they found themselves right where the Lord wanted them to be, and and Noah uh, could take two 
bunnies and and two tigers and and uh, two elephants and 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 two giraffes or or whatever the number were of each animal, they would be in sufficient numbers. Everything according to the word of God, and he he would have them um, enter into the ark, and and so that's not a problem at all. Okay, it goes on to say here in verse eight of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean, and of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. Now again, the animals that are being placed onto the ark were clean and some beasts that are not clean and fowls and, and things that creep and, and so forth. And we we talked about this a little earlier in Genesis 7 uh, because God made reference to this in verse 2 and 3 where he, he spoke of clean beasts and and not clean beasts. And and I'd like to mention again, because God's mentioning again, the clean animals, the word clean, leads us, it directs us, as we look up that word, to that which has become cleansed, they were washed. And therefore they um, spiritually represent sinners that have become cleansed from their sin. That is, they picture God's elect. But the not clean beast, the not clean animals, they are types and figures of the creation. Because these not clean animals are going to be delivered from the destruction of the earth. That is, the flood's going to wipe out everything with the breath of life. It's as though it pictures the end of the world, the the destruction of the entire creation. So, when the Lord has some not clean animals that he brings on board the ark, it is a figure of his intention to deliver the creation because these animals are the highest order of the creation apart from mankind. And, and, and they are spared the destruction of the flood. And when the flood has run its course, they come out of the ark. And, and the coming out of the ark is a picture of the new heaven and new earth. And it, it's as though they have, the creation has been redeemed. And I, I think that this is how it has to be for a couple of reasons. One, Notice I keep saying clean and not clean animals. And that's not easy to do because the Bible speaks so much of unclean animals or unclean um, uh, as far as um, being ceremonial unclean or or, um, someone spiritually unclean. But there is a word, an Old Testament word for unclean, that is not used here. The word describing these beasts that were loaded onto the ark, it, 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 first there's clean beasts and then not clean beasts. And that's a literal translation. The word clean is the same in, in, in both places. Speaking of the clean beasts and the not clean beasts. The only difference is that there's a, a negative that negates clean beasts. That, that that goes along with that. And I think that's significant that God is not saying unclean, that uh, like a leper is unclean and like leprosy represents sin. Th- this is a lesser or more mild way of indicating that something is not clean. It, it, uh, the, the word unclean is also translated as polluted. But... This, I think, is because the creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly. The creation, the animals, the trees, the sea, the mountains, and and all that's a part of this creation did not willingly sin against God. 
They did not rebel. It was only man that rebelled. And due to man's rebellion, God cursed the creation, making it not clean. And I think that's one reason. And also, I think Romans chapter 8 fully explains, as it says, and I'll read it again in Romans chapter 8, what's going on with the loading of the ark with people, clean animals and and not clean animals. It says in Romans 8, in verse 21, because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That's salvation language being used to describe the creation or the creature. And then it says in the next verse, verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. See how God is joining together the elect and their desire, uh, as it goes on to say, they're waiting for the, the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. He's joining together the desire of the elect for their new resurrected body with the desire of the creation to likewise receive redemption and deliverance. And that can only happen when there's a new creation. So the elect and the creation have a mutual desire for the end of the world and the new heaven and new earth and the new resurrected bodies for the elect. And we see this with the loading of the animals. There's the people, the the clean animals, then the not clean animals. Together, on board the ark, and the door shuts, and then they wait. They're the only ones. The only ones waiting. All the animals outside the ark perish. All the men outside the ark perish. The whole world perishes. Well, is the picture outside the ark. But on board, you have together the elect and the creation. The creation sharing that mutual desire for redemption. But they both have to groan and travail together on board the ark throughout the prolonged judgment period until their desire can be realized when finally the the waters of the flood recede, and it's as though they step out onto a, a new world, and 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 so I think it's very clear that that's the picture that God is painting here. I I don't see any other way of understanding it. Uh, I I believe it has to be that. Thank you for joining us for E Bible Fellowship's evening Bible studies with your host and Bible teacher Chris McCann. For more studies and information, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.org. Until our next Bible study, may the Lord's perfect will be done.